You can have a seat. I invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. That's way over there in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, real close to the front. And we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 33 today, and we're going to just look at a couple of verses. And I want to talk to you as I wrap up this series that we've been talking about, you know, problems that we all face. I want to talk to you about the issue of despair. When despair hits us in life, what do we do? When despair comes our way, to whom do we turn? When despair surrounds us, do we know who holds us and who cares for us and has that awesome and and tender and wonderful plan for us in life? You know, this past week, uh, my family and I have been away. We went over to the east coast of Florida and vacationed at Amelia Island, a little quiet there, shade and, you know, no traffic jams and all that kind of stuff, and some of the best fried shrimp I've ever had in my life uh, at this little place in town at Fernandina. But uh, don't all y'all rush over there and jam it up either. But, but uh, you know, in that time away, you know, you kind of, I just kind of cut things off, and somebody asked me, what did you do? I said, nothing. I really, I didn't do anything. I, I'd exercise in the morning. I'd just sit in a chair under an umbrella throughout the day until the rains came, and then go eat. You know, and sometimes it's good to do that, but I did catch on the news. You know, the devastating news of Malaysian Airline Flight 17 being shot down out of the skies over Ukraine by Russian surface-to-air missiles, flying along at 33,000 feet. And I, I've watched a couple of family interviews and such as, um, as the weekend has progressed, and, and there's a certain level of despair. What can we do? You know, all is lost. Life is gone. Life has no hope. Life is dark. Life is in despair. And maybe it was more personal for you this week in that you had a a visit maybe with a doctor and, and you got some word from your doctor that all was not well and all was not good and and you have something going on and and you feel a certain level of desperation. Or maybe it's a relational thing that has been going on between you and a loved one or between you and a friend and, and there's that level of, of desperation. Or, or perhaps, you know, it's a financial crisis. Whatever it may be, there are times in our lives when we reach into a place of despair. And certainly Moses, the leader of the children of Israel, understood despair to a degree perhaps greater than we can ever even understand. For the first 40 years of his life, he didn't understand who he was, and he lived as a son of Pharaoh. For the next 40 years of his life, he would discover who he was as he would be on the run, and he'd have an encounter with the living God. And for the last 40 years of his life, he would know who God was as God would lead and guide and provide for the children of Israel throughout all those years of wandering in the wilderness. And in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 33, in the 26th verse, the Bible says, There is none like you, God. O Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty, the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he thrust out the enemy before you and said, destroy. So Israel lived in safety. Jacob lived alone in a land of grain and wine whose heavens dropped down dew. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your triumph. Your enemy shall come fawning to you and you shall tread upon their backs. Moses expresses these words of inspirational truth because they were truths about his faith. He had come to realize certain things when he served in the courts of Pharaoh and when he was on the peak of Mount Sinai. And when he was in that hurried and fast run from Egypt and in the calm and in the glory of sitting in the presence of the divine God. And now when we read these words, Moses has come to the completion of his work on earth. He has given the law. He has led the children of Israel. 
He has arrived at the, at the, at, at, in sight of Canaan, the promised land, which he was not being able to go into. And so God invited him up onto Mount Nebo to see the land and then to die. Wow, that's kind of heavy, isn't it? To see the land and then to die. And as he is there on Mount Nebo, and as he looks across this land of promise, but yet he knows he's fixing to die, he's able to express these words that the eternal God is your dwelling place. And underneath are the everlasting arms. He's lived life, he's facing death, he's able to pronounce the truth. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He's affirming his confidence in God that anything in life or death, he knows that God is in charge and that God is in control. And the biggest question I think that has to be answered is to whom do these arms really belong to? Is he talking about God? Do these arms belong to God? Is that where we put our trust? When he says the eternal God is your dwelling place? Because, you know, for the most part, we don't live like that. We live in a materialistic uh, age. I was uh, watching a little bit of the stuff on Nat Geo on the decades of the 80s and the 90s and the 70s and all this kind of stuff. And remember in the 70s, it was flower power and peace, peace out and all that kind of stuff. And then in the 80s, uh, we, we transitioned out of leisure suits. How many of you guys had a leisure suit in the 70s? Oh, don't tell anybody else after today. That confession's done. A and men actually had platform shoes, make them a little bit taller. You know, Gary, you probably had some about that high, didn't you? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but you had hair in the 70s. I've seen pictures down here, man, looking good. And, and, but in the 80s, it was the women that had hair. You know, it was big hair, remember? Y'all would do all that junk up on top and have it flowing down your back. And I mean, it was big hair, and you went to a can of hairspray a day. And, and But what they were saying about what happened in the 80s and the 90s was materialism came into being because, you know, it was then that the malls began to be developed across the country. And, and you could uh, go to the mall and it did this little snapshot on the, on the Valley Girls and how you could go and do all your stuff, you know. And, and, uh, and we became very materialistically oriented, more so than we had ever been in this culture before. But one of the things that we find with our materialism is our materialism fails, how many of you have ever gotten a new car? And, and when you got that new car, wasn't it the greatest thing that you'd ever had? Man, you loved it. It was shining. The paint was just right. There wasn't a scratch on it. You parked at the far end of the Walmart parking lot, and when you came back out, a buggy had gone across the entire parking lot and got in your car, and it got its first ding. And through many more dings, that car is just an old piece of junk now. It doesn't hang on. Materialism doesn't last. And, and, you know, man, for the most part, you know, we don't think about eternity so much. Yet in our quest for meaning in life, you know, we want purpose, we want meaning. You know, we cannot avoid eternity because, you see, we are creatures of eternity. And, and, and so, you know, what really then is, a, is the answer for life? And what is the answer for death as we seek meaning and as we seek purpose and as we seek a reality of truth? Well, the, life, the answer for life, we find right here, the eternal God is your dwelling place. And you know, it doesn't really matter how depraved an individual may be. You know, you may be the sorriest, lowest scoundrel on planet Earth. It doesn't matter how depraved you may be. We have been made for God. We have been created in His image, and no matter what we try to fill our hearts and our lives with, we can never fill that void spot where God belongs. We go after things that are going to make us happy. We go after things that are going to make us productive. We're going to go after things that tend to give us a, a sense of worth. But what we discover is those things do not last because we were made for God. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes that God has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity into man's heart. 
He's put a, eternity into man's heart. And the 70s then, in that Jesus revolution that came about, it came at the end of a decade-long p- t- uh, period of, of free love and, and free sex and, and peace and out and uh, the protest and the anti-Vietnam and the Vietnam and, and all the junk that went on. There was a Jesus revolution that came about in the mid-1970s. It was the first sparks of revival that this nation had seen since the last great awakening. And that Jesus revolution has been really the last spark of revival we have seen as a nation. Because we've become so materialistic, we've become so satisfied with ourselves, we've become so happy in what we can do and what we can accomplish, we fail to recognize that the real answer in life is a relationship with a living God. And when I come to a place where I can believe God, I have everything I need to live. And and, and when life is hard, and when all the synthetic and, and all the sophisticated living is over, and when it fails to satisfy, only one thing matters. And that's God who is eternal. You're not a God, little g, made with human hands, the song says. He is the living and the eternal God. You know, Helen Keller, how many, everybody remembers Helen Keller. You've studied Helen Keller in school. And, and I didn't realize this until I Googled it up as I was putting this together, that she didn't die until 1968. I was thinking when I was a kid, she was ancient back then. But she didn't die until 1968. And if you know anything about Helen Keller, she was a writer and she was a lecturer and she was blind and she was deaf from infancy. At the age of nine, her family hired a tutor to try to uh, establish communication with her because she'd never been able to communicate with anybody. Couldn't see, couldn't hear. You know, and, and one summer day, her instructor, you know, took her by her hand and, 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 and poured cold well water over her hand and tapped cold. And all of a sudden, it dawned on, on Helen what was transpiring, and, and there was communication that happened. She was filled with joy, and, uh, you know, the, the, the little biography says, you know, that, that she was fast to learn from that point forward. And at this point, you know, she'd been able, nobody had been able to tell her about God. And her family, who were Christians, they called on a certain uh, evangelist by the names of Phillips Brooks who came and shared with her the good news of, of Jesus Christ. And, and up until this point, she had not heard anything about God. She had not heard anything about Jesus Christ and salvation. And this is what she said to Phillips Brook. She said, I've been wishing for quite a while that someone would talk to me about him. I've been thinking about him for a long time. You see, deep within her heart, God had placed eternity. And it doesn't matter where you travel to in the world. Do you realize that's the case with people all over the world? There's, there's an eternity of, there's an eternal link within their hearts, and, and it's missing. In Papua New Guinea, we've discovered that missing link there to be, you know, uh, the people try to fulfill it with the birds of the air or, or um, with, uh, with, with what they call box religion. And box religion was from the World War II, they'd see the... Different militaries come with their boxes of goods and supplies and think this God's going to drop them a box. You know, and there's all that kind of stuff. But eternity's in our heart. And we're looking to fulfill our hearts. We're looking to fulfill our lives in some way, in some form, in something imaginable. And, and, and so, you know, the, 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 the truth is, God is the answer for life. But what about death? What about when death comes? Is God the answer in death? The eternal God is your dwelling place. Moses is now facing death, and and God's about to bury him in a secret place that's never been excavated even until this day. And yet he could say, the eternal God is my dwelling place. He understood that God was the answer for life, and he was the answer in death. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 that it's appointed unto man once and to die, and after that comes the judgment. As I've traveled across the United States and I've been in many parts of the world, I've been to a lot of cemeteries. And particularly in these mountains of North Georgia and Tennessee and North Carolina, and you get back into some of those hollows or hollers, however you pronounce it from where you're from, 
And you find a little wood frame church and a little cemetery beside it. And you know what I have discovered is that death does not discriminate according to age. You see some infant graves one day, some three days, some three months. You see sometimes in a period of a month and a particular year, all these people and children that died because some fever had come through town. And death does not discriminate. James, the brother of Jesus, said, you don't know what tomorrow may bring. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. See, we're creatures of eternity. We weren't made to be here forever. As a matter of fact, Paul refers to this life that we live in right now as being in this earthly tent. And, and you know something about tents, right? You've, you've gone camping before. And you know, when you're a kid, it's fun to go camping. When you're an adult, it's fun to go camping. But listen, it's awful good when you get back home into your bed with the air conditioning going, without a mosquito buzzing around your head or an ant crawling into your ear, and, and, and your bed is soft and your pillow is just right. It's always good to get back home. We are not fully at home on earth. We're passing through as in a tent. We're creatures of eternity. And life really begins for us when we pass through the valley of the shadow of death. And so the big question that comes to us, is that eternal God my refuge? Is the eternal God my dwelling place? Do I walk with Him and talk with Him? You know, one of the big discussions in our household is with my granddaughter. For some reason, she wants a dog. And, you know, a lot of times in these last couple of weeks, you know, if you come up and say hi to her, she'll say, Pops won't let me have a dog. <laughs> At Amelia Island last week, you know, she pet somebody's nice dog, and she looks up and says, Pop says I can't have a dog. They look at me like, what kind of a cruel Pops are you? But, you know, you know if you've had an animal, you understand it's a lot of upkeep, and every time you go, you got to put them up, and, and, all that, and shots, and all that kind of stuff. But won't let me have a dog. But, you know, I did read about this one little boy that got to have a dog for his birthday. His pops took him to get a puppy. And, and they went to, to where the litter of puppies was. And, and, and there was, a, you know, kind of a big boxed-in area where all of them were. And, you know, some of them were snuggled up next to their mama dog. And, and some of them, you know, were acting shy and turned away. But this one little puppy came running up. Just a wag in its tail, and he says, I want that one. And his pop says, why do you want that one? He says, I want the one that's got the happy ending. <laughs> now, think about this. Don't you want your life to be the life that talks about being the life with a happy ending? Well, the only way that's going to happen is when this eternal God, when this eternal God becomes your dwelling place. When he becomes your dwelling place. And, and so... You know, what we find then, if he's going to be my dwelling place, this is what he promises. He promises security. You see, the everlasting arms are secure. The eternal God is your dwelling place. The children of Israel, they, they needed to be reminded here. Moses is about to die, and here he's got to remind them, you know, you've been living in tents for 40 years. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little A.C.? Wouldn't it be nice to flip on the ceiling fan? Wouldn't it be nice not to have to go out and gather manna in the morning? Wouldn't it be nice, you know, you're homeless though. And, and your, nation, your national future seems uncertain simply because it's hidden. But they, but they were in the presence of the eternal God. The eternal God is your dwelling place. And you see, ultimately, this is the only thing that matters. You know, the world in which we live, you know, it's empty. And we're just passing through. It's temporary and it's lonely. And this world in which we live is a, is a homeless place. And we need the security of the everlasting God of security. We don't know what a day will bring forth. And so God replaces our insecurities of, of emptiness... Carl Jung, the psych psychologist, said the central neurosis of our time is emptiness. Things may satisfy our bodies, people may satisfy our souls, but only God can satisfy our spirits. Things may satisfy our bodies. 
You know, there's a lot of things that give momentary satisfaction. But what, as, um, as um, the soul song goes, I can't get no. Come on, you know it. Satisfaction. And I've tried. Right? You know, I can't get it. They may satisfy us for a little bit, but it doesn't last. And people may satisfy our souls, in other words, our intellectual self. It's great to have conversation. It's great to have a friend here and there passing through. But it's only God that can satisfy our spirits because, you see, without God as our dwelling place, as our refuge, our life is empty. And that's why people seek to fill the emptiness. But I think, man, if I can get in on one more cell, if I can develop this business, if I can, if I can, if I can cut out this body, if, if I can look that good, if I can be all that. And they get all that and they find out, well, that doesn't satisfy. And, and when we're overwhelmed, you ever feel overwhelmed? Man, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with my finances? What am I going to do with my kids? What am I going to do with him or with her? You know what? What? We need a refuge. We need a place in which we can go. And the only real and true refuge that we find is the dwelling place of the eternal God. A place of of inexpressible rest and a place of inexpressible peace. And God replaces our loneliness. You know, we get lonely, you know, and, and it comes when, as we're living, and it comes when we're dying. You know, oftentimes in the summer, my family will leave for a week, and you know, the first day or so, it's pretty good. It's quiet. Nothing's going on. But you know, after a couple of days, it gets too quiet. It gets too much not going on. There's not anything freshly cooked when I come through the door, which my wife spoils me and gets me accustomed to. And there's not the, the, the sound of feet walking in and keys dropping at the front, ta- at the front door and all this different kind of stuff. And, and we get to where we want to be around people once again. And what we find then, even in our loneliness though, that the eternal God is our dwelling place. And this dwelling place is the answer to the, to the emptiness and to the loneliness that, that we feel. You know, we're always trying to escape. We're always trying to to find a way. And this God who is that dwelling place, the Bible tells us in the Psalms that you make known to me the path of life. You know, we think we're going in all these right directions and we're making all these right decisions and, and stuff and they end up not always being right and they end up not always feeling good. But the Bible says that God makes known to us the path of life. What's this life that God's talking about? You know, does God want you on a McDonald's diet? You know, where you think, man, you've really eaten at a fancy place when you go through the drive through and your order's wrong? And you think, well, wow, I'm really progressing. I, 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 I've, I've got salt and pepper now to go on my fries for the second time you go through. Is that all God wants for you? You know, does does God want to just leave you in a place where you're just subsisting? Or does he want to bring you to a place of life? The Lord Jesus Christ said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. You know what it means to be abundant? As the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, thy comfort me. You make me, uh, you, you're with me in the presence of my enemies, and my cup overflows. It means to have a cup that's not just half full. It means to have a cup that's not just to the brim, but it means to be overflowing in life. And so the psalmist says, you make known to me the path of life. And then he goes on and he says, and in your presence there is the fullness of joy. The fullness of joy. You know, you can have joy even in times of despair. Joy inexpressible and filled with glory. And in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
And so what I get from that is nothing, absolutely nothing, compares to having communion, to having correspondence, to having relationship with God. And God is the answer to our homelessness. For nearly 40 years, the children of Israel had wandered around the, the wilderness without a permanent home, without a permanent dwelling. But in the middle of it all, God was their dwelling place. He was a fiery pillar by night and as a cloud by day. And you know what, the, you know what home speaks of? It, it speaks of security. Have you ever thought about home being that place of security? Man, you can go in and let the big hair down, right? You can go home and you can kick off your shoes and let your feet just smell up like crazy. Home's a place of security. You know, I remember when I was a little boy, it was the day John F. Kennedy was being buried. Second grade. And so we were out of school, and there were four of us that always ran around, ran around together. John and Bruce, Robin and me. And sometimes we'd get into a, a fight. And, some, and, and every time we got into the fight, it was always three on one. And on that day, I was the one. And I wasn't going to take it. I picked up a big stick and I whooped those boys down there in the, in the gully. I held on to my stick. I charged up the hill. I jumped on my bicycle. I rode down the road. I'm looking over my shoulder and they're coming on just as fast as I'm going. I, I whip it into my yard and off my bicycle and I pop them a couple more times and around the house and into the carport. In the carport... The skirmish goes on. I've got, I've got Bruce and I've got Robin and I'm popping their legs like crazy and John's standing far enough away from my stick that he can just laugh. My mother comes to the door and breaks it up. Sends me inside, sends them home. Why did I head to my house? Because it was a place of security. I remember returning home one time after um, being overseas for about 18 months in the military and my mom knew I was coming, and I remember opening the back door and the aroma of that chicken and rice and peach cobbler pie. That place of security, that place of substance, that, that place of fellowship, that place of joy. And the Bible tells us that the eternal God is your dwelling place. And He's your place of security, just like Linus' blanket was in the Peanuts cartoon. Jesus is the real security that, that, uh, that lasts for eternity. And how do I know that? Because I know that God is able. Have you ever thought about the ability of God? The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath... And underneath are the everlasting arms. The climax, really, of the passage is for all of us. The everlasting arms, they speak of, of strength, and they speak of support, and they speak of ability. And, and what's the range of those arms? How wide do those arms reach? Those arms reach out on Calvary's cross and says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I am able I am merciful. I am graceful. Underneath are those everlasting arms. This word, underneath, only occurs this one time in the Bible. It brings to us the gravity, the gravity, the weightiness of this everlasting God that holds everything together. The foundation of life, the foundation of philosophy, of religion, and of theological thought is God, who is everlasting. You know, throughout the centuries, boys have split rocks open to see what they look like on the inside. We have dove in, div, dived into the waters of the deep and hardly know what lies beneath the surface of our oceans. We've sent man into space so as to discover what is out there. And, and we basically come back to the same conclusion. It is the God of eternity with His everlasting arms that holds everything together. 
You know, think of the junk we deal with in life. We deal with defeat. You ever felt defeated? Certainly you feel defeated. The psalmist said, you know, he said, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. In sin, you know, we're, we're subject to defeat at every single turn. You know, we don't have the power in ourselves to overcome our flesh, to overcome the world, to overcome the devil. And the enemy of our soul, Satan himself, the Bible says he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants, he wants to destroy you. And we have to deal with distress because defeat brings on distress and depression. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers ever, in one of his sermons he said, I suppose some brethren have neither much elevation or depression. I could almost wish to share in their peaceful life, for I am much tossed up and down, and although my joy is greater than that of most men, my depression is such as few can have any idea of. You know, there's people in the church, I've told you all this before, we, we're, we're a hospital of messed up people, really. You know, we all have our issues. You know, some are, as they used to say, melancholic. They're just depressed. And, 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 and some of them, you know, some of us, you know, are overly joyful. And, and, and some of us, we've got our hiccups and our hang-ups, and we've got warts. And this is what Spurgeon is revealing of himself. He said, This week, in some respects, has been the best, the crowning week of my life, but it closed in horror of great darkness, of which I will say no more than this. I bless God that at my worst, I bless God that at my worst, underneath, I have found the everlasting arms. I'm learning to lean, the old song says, I'm learning to lean. Learning to lean on Jesus. And so we, we have defeat, we have distress, we have despair. And in those times of despair, it's the Holy Spirit that comes and whispers fresh into our being. But underneath are the everlasting arms. When life seems dark, when life seems hopeless, when it seems like everything's been lost, when our health is gone, when our family members have gone, when the planes have been shot out of the air, underneath are the everlasting arms. How strong are those arms? If you notice anything I sign off on, I typically sign it off. I think I did it this way. Yes, yeah, that way in the bulletin, in his grip. In that grip is strength. The grip of God's strength. In his grip. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Those arms that were stretched out on Calvary, on the cross, demonstrates that God was saying to people all over the world that whosoever will may come. In the book of the Revelation, in chapter 22, it says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who desires take the water of life without price. And over and over again, God's invitation has been to us to come. To us to come. I think the best illustrated story is that of the prodigal son that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. You know, he, he came to his senses. He went back to his father. The father saw him and had compassion. And he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. He said, bring out the best robe and put sandals on his feet and a ring upon his finger. In the place of, in the place of defeat, in the place of distress, God gave forgiveness. And he gave fellowship. And he gave fullness. The father demonstrated it. He arose and he came to his father. But while he was still away off, the Bible says, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. No words could better tell of the forgiving of a loving God. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how low down and sorry you may have been. There's a God who is eternal who loves you. He's got an awesome plan for your life. And fellowship. Boy, fellowship's important, isn't it? The father tells him, you know, to not only bring out the best robe and to put a ring on his hand, but put shoes on his feet. It was a reinstatement. You know, when 
relationship's been broken, that's what sin does between you and I and God. Man, you know, when you are the offender, you know, you don't walk very proudly, do you? You know, you're a little sheepish when you're the offender. I mean, think about how it is in personal relationships. You have offended somebody. You don't want to just go walking up to them and say, hey, man, it's great to see you. I mean, if you do that, you're lying to yourself. Because for you right at that moment, it doesn't feel so great to see that person because you're feeling guilt. Right? When the father put all this on that boy, he was restoring fellowship. He was reinstating. And that's what the Heavenly Father does in our hearts. When Jesus comes to be our Savior, to be our Lord, the Father reinstates relationship with himself through Jesus Christ. There's fellowship and there's fullness. He had the fattened calf killed. You know, you'll never be fuller. You'll never have more than what you have when you walk with the Lord in the light of His way. You know, Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. With every spiritual blessing. Don't you want to have everything that God has for you? Think about that. Everything that God has for you. You don't want to leave anything behind. You know, I was thinking about that a lot over these last couple of weeks. Talking to God out of my morning run. After I had walked and seen our children's division. And hit with the truthful reality that we've let things slip. And in talking to God, I have to ask forgiveness as a father, as a husband, as a pastor, as your pastor. That I'd gotten comfortable not realizing the potential of every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And began praying, God, what, what am I to do? What's the next step? What's the corrective course of action? How are these things restored? Second Chronicles 7, 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I believe that God has been speaking to my heart to call us as His people to a time of extraordinary prayer because we live in extraordinary times. And we live before an extraordinary God who answers in extraordinary ways. Seeking His face for revival in our own personal lives. You know, as, as Christians, we say we don't like what's going on in Washington, and we don't like the president, and all these different kinds of things. But have we really prayed about it? Have I walked in the presence, in the dwelling place of God, every moment of every day in my life? Have I done my part? We have got to be about prayer. We've got to be about our kids. We've got to be about bringing things up and bringing them up to speed. But the fastest way to see those things done is when we as God's people come and bow on our knees. Come and bow on our, our knees. When we come and we get God's opinion, when we get God's direction, when we get God's command on that which we are supposed to be about. And I believe if we want God's blessing in our life, and in this church, and in this nation, and in this world, we have first of all got to come together in prayer. Extraordinary prayer. For extraordinary times. To bring us 
as the people of God into the dwelling place. You see, we live in a time when it's too easy to be self-dependent. Oh, we got this. Let's go to church this Sunday. Let's check it off. We've, we've been to church lately. Is that what God's looking for in his people? I don't think so. God's looking for extraordinary people, for extraordinary prayer, for extraordinary times. He's looking for people that know that he, the eternal God, is the dwelling place. And underneath are the everlasting arms. The other day I had Zoe in my arms out in the Atlantic Ocean. We were chest high in water and she got a little scared and I just held her tighter. You know, there's no way I was going to let go. She was in my grip. As a child of God, you're in his grip. You're in his grip, and God's not going to let go of you. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose for you in your life that only you can fulfill. And he calls you to be serious about it. Church, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I want the story with the happy ending. I hope you do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're so merciful towards us and that your grace is extended. Lord, as your spirit calls today, I, I ask you to impede upon hearts of lost people that they need Jesus more than anything else in life. And Lord, I ask you to speak to the hearts of your people and call us to come as we are in your dwelling place. Lord, that you may hear from heaven, that you may forgive our sin, that you may heal our land. Lord, I look forward to the day of a, of a healing within the church and it's overflowing with people seeking your face. I look forward to the day, Lord, of children learning and running and being happy and singing praises to God. Because we have answered your call to care. Lord, I look forward to a day of students overflowing from the student building. Praising God and living for Jesus with lives that are lifted up to you. Lord, I look forward to the day of your people coming together for extraordinary times of prayer. For extraordinary prayer in their lives. And Father, we ask you to help it to begin right now. Right now, in each of our hearts, we each individually pray, in my life, oh God, in my life, in my day, in my time, right now, God, would you so work according to your goodness and grace. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's come. Stand together. Come as we are. Don't wait and go home and say, I'm going to get it fixed. I'm going to get it right. It's not going to happen. It gets right right here. Come just as you are.